Okay, uh, b before I start this chapter, this is chapter five of the Feature Engineer Selection uh, textbook. And this one is about uh, exploring the, the, your data set using visualization, right? Visualization techniques. And I just want to know if any one of you have any experience with, uh, for example, ggplot or any other library, uh, Okay, uh, are you familiar, uh, you know, with ggplot, for example? Yeah. How to construct, sure. like, let's say, a line plot, box yeah. plot, you know, scatter plot. Okay, good. Good. This I this is four, though, though isn't it? Well, we're, we're, did they change the chapter? Uh, number, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, you're right, Jim. Good, good catch. Be because what? I have five. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah. Next I, week. You have five. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently. Thank you. Apparently, I use a clone with chapter five, and you know, it's it's it's, it's, it's still there. So it's chapter four, yeah, chapter four. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, so that, that's basically what we're being, you know, going to talk about. You know, understand uh, two data sets, right? The Chicago Train Ridership, which is one of the most popular from the author, especially Max. Uh, he uses also in tiny models. And then also the OK uh, Cupid that we have seen this uh, before. Uh, Federica, do you want to say something before we start? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, that it's all it's all fine. So uh, yeah, you are going to uh, present this chapter. No, I don't know. I'm quite practiced using uh, ggplot too. So <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm um, okay. Yeah, quite happy to. To follow this session yeah the floor is yours ricardo okay. <laughs> excellent excellent yeah i just want to make sure that you know that i don't have to touch into basic topics that i can then you know move more to the analysis okay Great. all right so uh these are the objectives uh can you see my screen well do you need a, any zoom yeah maybe a little bit a little bit more yeah. Agree, yeah a little bigger font would be great uh how's that good good okay okay so uh we're going to be exploring like i said we're going to be exploring two uh, two data sets uh the first one is going to be the chicago train ridership and the other one is the okay cupid is the matching the matching uh uh data set that uh, max uh likes to use uh we're going to be talking about univariate in other words exploring one variable probably the outcome and then some predictors and then the bivariate uh, visualizations okay two two variables an outcome a predictor or uh different predictors then uh, uh we're going to be doing that for numerical variables then we're going to be performing some visualizations for the categorical ones that's where the all Cupid, okay, Cupid, uh, you know, get gets uh, gets presented. The Chicago train is more for numeric, and uh, we're going to do some uh, if we can because I still have that pending. Okay, I, I mean, there's a lot of material to cover, so uh, I'll I'll have that in the in the in, in the book notes, uh, performing some postmodern visualizations, but it's the shorter one. You know, the meat is more in the numerical and categorical variables. Okay. So, first of all, let's understand what type of chart corresponds to the type of variable, right? For example, scatter plots. Scatter plots are very useful for visualizing uh, numerical, numerical variables, numerical to numericals. Okay. Uh, it, it could tell you some linear correlation or the absence of that linear correlation, non-linear. Then we have uh, our box plots, right? Or uh, another name for it is box and whisker plots. It's a non-parametric. In other words, it just uses the data. It doesn't make an assumption of any distribution. And it's useful for numerical, but also for categorical and numerical values, variables. And we'll, we'll, you know, I'll, I'll show you an example of that. Then we have our bar, bar plots, which are the counts, okay? Usually used for categorical variables. 
line plots. Line plots are very useful, for example, for time series, okay, where you have uh, you know, a date or a time component, and then you have a count, right? You know, a, a, a numerical uh, variable. You have the, your histograms. Your histograms, they are very useful because combined with the box plot, they will show you how is the distribution, the shape of that distribution. The box plots have that disadvantage that they don't tell you exactly how is the shape or the distribution. I will see an example of that. Then you have your heat maps. Your heat maps is more or less, uh, you know, uh, it's like a rectangle numerical uh, table, but instead of the numbers, you're going to see colors, okay? And depending on the scale that you use, you're going to see colors that reflect, you know, uh, a, a higher degree or non-degree, a zero or a low degree. A very useful for visualizing correlations with multiple variables, with a lot of variables, okay? Because the eye uh, tends to distinguish more the color than the, than the numbers. And also you have your summary tables, which are part of your you know, visualization too. Okay, one of the uh, reference that I use also for this, you know, to navigate this chapter is this, uh, this book, which is also open source. It's called Data Visualization with R. So let me put it right there in the chat. So we have the benefit, right? On our log. Uh, very useful. And when we go to the categorical, uh, we got categorical variables, when we're going to be talking about mosaic plots, uh, there's a nice explanation of how to interpret those, those plots. Okay. Question so far. Good. All right. So let's dig in. So let's first talk about this uh, Chicago train ridership. According to the, to the book, okay, um, this is the data set is the daily ridership of one specific uh, you know, line in the, Chicago, in the Chicago area. It's called the L train. And it's, if you can see the map, the map is the red line you know, that you can see that goes from north to south and it passes through downtown. The particular ridership that we're going to be discussing is the one centered in the Clark Lake Station. Um, because I want to, you know, the map of the Chicago MTA, uh, it just to you know, the stations of the train. But I, I would like to see a little bit more about the spatial, right, component. So here, if you can see my mouse, here is a blue pin here. This is the area that we are, you know, discussing. And if you have gone to Chicago, uh, Chicago has like the, 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 their fifth avenue is Michigan Avenue, right? And then, you know, like any other city, they have a downtown. So this area, which is called the loop, okay, where basically most of the trains meet, so that's the center, that's the, this, this uh, square here, rectangle here, uh, that's where a lot of uh, activity goes on because there's a lot of transfers uh, between, between lines, okay? So just to give you a spatial idea of where, you know, what we're talking about. Okay, so the data set that, is presented in the book uh, from the repository, which is called the Chicago.R data. Uh, it's a data set that has around 5,700 observations, rows, and then it has 1,092 columns, 1,092 variables. One of the variables is, cost of, of course, the readership, the, the ridership, and the ridership is this one, okay? That ID, S underscore 4380 corresponds to the ridership of the Clark uh, Lake Station. Then you have different, uh, uh, different features, okay? From the date, you can have the date of the week, you can have the date of the year, you can have the week, the month, and holidays, lag features, etc. So I believe, you know, I haven't, I read the whole book yet, but I believe that we're going to be talking about how to do some feature selection depending on an analysis because 1,092 variables is a lot for any, any algorithms. So we have to kind of you know, reduce this uh, dimensionality, okay? And the ridership, as you can see, 
is in thousands. In other words, this 15.732, what it means is 15,732 riders on that particular day, okay? So before going to what the plus that you saw in the textbook, I usually like to get acquainted with some of my you know, own uh, plots, you know, basic plots, right? And because this is a time, you know, a time event. In other words, we are talking about daily ridership by day. Uh, one of the things that I did was, uh, you know, plot uh, a line plot, right? You know, this one line plot. But instead of the daily, when I plot the daily, it just is like a big black blob. Okay, you know, you cannot distinguish anything because you know there's so 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 many things happen. It's too busy. Uh, the the graph. So what I did was that I summarized it by month, okay? And the reason that we have this, you know, spike here, especially at the beginning, January, is because the data doesn't begin at the 1st of January. It begins on the 22nd. So if we summarize by month, then January is going to be a little bit short, right? Uh, it's going to have less ridership than the others. That, that, that the other uh, monthly monthly riders. So a uh, question, uh, what do you observe in that uh, in that plot? Uh, anyone? Looks like day of the week matters a lot. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, especially at the month, right? Because this is this is by month, by month, okay? Yeah, oh. monthly ridership. I Why converted the daily rider, I converted to a month. Okay. It so looks summer, like there's a summertime. spike during the summer. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's the case. You have these I... peaks, right? This, uh, you know, these jagged peaks, and they correspond to month, uh, summer, summer months. The opposite is true. In the winter months, then you have the low ridership. So you have a seasonal, a very, very, uh, you know, marked seasonal component. What about the ridership? Has it going down? Uh, is it steady? Is it going down? Is it going up? Increasing. Yeah. It's increasing, right? So we have a trend that is going up, you know, every time, you know, within, you know, certain periods. Okay, this data is only until August 2016. I did an experiment on my own to get the most recent data. And of course, during the pandemic, uh, you know, period, there was a big cliff, <laughs> okay? You know, the big ridership, and they haven't recouped it. And this has happened you know, all over uh, the US and probably around the world. So you can say a lot about this, right? About this, this plot that, you know, you have a seasonal component and also you have a trend component, right? Okay, so those are things that they're, they, they're going to help you in your analysis and try to get some features that could give you a good prediction of the future ridership. Okay, so let's not stop there because we already have day of the week, right? We saw that, that feature there, DOW. Then let's do some box plots with summarizing the day of the week and then the riderships. This one is, you know, daily ridership, you know, the, the, the whole ridership for each of the days. And what we can see is that, especially on Wednesdays and Thursday, those are the top, right? Those are the top, and even Friday, you know, with this outlier here, they're kind of the top ridership, you know, within the week. And we can see that Sunday and Saturday, the week, the weekends are very low. So we can see a, a, a contrast between weekdays and weekends. And the book is going to explore a little more about that. But right now we are seeing that that particular you know, uh, feature. So if you don't have weekdays or weekends, probably will be a good feature to create, right? So we can capture that, that, uh, you know, that, that, that contrast in ridership, okay? Now, uh, you know, from this box plot, because the box doesn't give you, you know, information about the shape of the distribution, then you can do a violin plot. Okay, and the violin plot is because of the shape, right? The violin that has, you know, like a, you know, <laughs> wiggly shape there. And as you can see, uh, 
all of these distributions by day, they kind of have, you know, a wedge in the middle, right? So you have kind of a bimodal distribution here. So you have really two modes that are occurring in different, maybe different periods of the, you know, of, 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 different, of, of, the, of different days, okay? Especially here in Saturday, you can see it very clear here. You know, one big, you know, uh, 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 width there at the bottom and the other one also has a little bit more width there. Okay, and then we can have another box plots of the rides, but now by month, instead of by day, by month. And in the monthly, as we saw in that line plot that you said that, you know, in the summers, you know, you got the peaks, in the, in the winter, you got the low, the, the low end. Uh, we can see that really the peak here, according to the box plot, is in June. So June is the one that reflects the most uh, total ridership. And then January and December and February, the winter months are the ones that are, you know, lower. So right now we have a good idea of more or less, you know, how this, you know, temporal events, time events, day of the week, um, month, et cetera, are playing, you know, with the consequence of the rider. Okay. Okay, so now th this is the textbook, you know, the textbook graphics. And they started with a box plot, uh, checking, you know, very fine or analyzing the response, which is the ridership. And this is the box plot for the total ridership, no matter, you know, the, the, the day or the time or the month or whatever, it's the total ridership. And as you can see in the, in the middle, there's, a, there's like, a, like a vertical line, black line, that is the median, okay? So if we split, if we split our distribution of daily riderships in half, that half is going to be the number. And that number is around 15.9, uh, you know, 1,000, of course. It's interesting also to, to notice that in this plot, there's no outliers. Sometimes the outliers are the dots that go uh, beyond the upper limit or uh, under. The, the the lower limit and in this one you don't see any outliers which is pretty interesting now like i said one of the disadvantages of this plot is that you don't have an idea of how the shape of the distribution is and it's important why because depending on the distribution then you need to make some decisions in terms of transformation or not right so in the book we got three plots, okay, that the authors uh, give us, which is a histogram of the same data, the daily ridership, ridership, the same box plot, and then the violin plot. And as you can see, the violin plot and the histogram gives us a peak of what this shape is. So how would you characterize this distribution? How would you call it? Bimodal. Bimodal, right? Okay, in other words, they are kind of like two peaks, right? Two peaks, two kind of uh, segments. So this is going to be useful to try to model this. Uh, sometimes I have seen that you can split your data, okay? Depending on the writers, you can split your data into, and then focus on one segment of the data with one model and then another segment of the data with another model okay i've seen i've seen that because this one apart from you know having that characteristic probably would need a strong transformation for example for a linear regression it would be in strong transformation because linear regression assumes that the variables have a gaussian shape or a normal bell curve shape Okay, so you're going to have a little bit of difficulty there for linear regression, maybe not for other, other algorithms. Okay, so this is informing some of the steps that you have to take account. So then when you go modeling, you get the, you know, the most of it, okay? Uh, comments, questions so far? Good, all good? Okay. Are there transformations to take uh, a distribution like that and create a uh, binary variable? 
to say it's one class or the other? Uh, yeah. The, the thing is that the, the goal here is to try to predict a future ridership. So you are already in, a, in the regression area, right? Okay. If you were in the classification area, then you could say, okay, I'm going to classify between less than, let's say, less than the mean and more than the mean or the median. Okay. But in this case in particular, the problem is, the goal is, the objective is to uh, predict future, future uh, volume. And it's, and, and it's useful for the transit authority because then they can program the resources according to that, you know, to that volume. Okay, you know, the number of trains, the number of stations that are going to be available, etc. So it's a question of, you know, of, of resources that you have to, you know, you have to uh, juggle here. I, I know well, you yeah. said you didn't read the whole book yet, but like, right. what, do, what do we, what do we do with a variable like this? Like, you just said it's non-Gaussian, right? It's bimodal. Right. What do you, what do you do with a variable like this? Well, my, my, my first uh, instinct, right, is to uh, do a transformation. And I think someone is chatting, you know, put it in chat there. Uh, do, do some kind of transformation. Uh, it could be a box box because remember the box box, although it's a good tool, you have to be careful that there are no, no, no zeros, no zeros or negative values because, it, you know, it will blow up. That's why you sometimes you use the year Johnson name. But you can use you know different different methods, try to get as much as possible like Gaussian. Or like I said, you know, I have seen that they split the data set in, in, in two in, 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 in two in two sets. Okay. So there's there, there's ways to uh, you know to tackle this. Okay. Probably the authors, you know, were very, uh, uh, you know, it, it was on purpose, you know, that they showed they chose this because it cre it creates, you know, a lot of questions, right? <laughs> it's not your typical uh, empty cars or you know, uh, 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 you know, the data set data set model. Okay, so let's continue uh, analyzing this. And one of the things that the authors also introduce is the concept of using facets, right? Using colors and using shapes. In this one, as we saw in the box plot, that there's a big difference between ridership during the weekdays and ridership during the weekends. Uh, this plot really, you know, gets to the point, right? During the weekdays, there's a concentration, right? Of the riders, on the left side of that distribution and then there's a big tail to the left okay so you know it's very skewed very skewed variable to the left if we are going to uh model this you know just the weekdays then of course you know this would need some some kind of transformation the weekends aren't it's not that bad the weekends you know they just you know have these two you know modes right these two most frequent uh, values that also have need to be addressed but it's not that skewed as the, you know, as, as, as the week, okay? Just another visualization of the problem that we were seeing with the, with the weekdays and weekends, okay? All right, let's look then at the scatter plot. The scatter plot they present us here, is a scatter plot, but it's from the current uh, ridership, right? The current day ridership, and then they created a 14 day lag. In other words, we're going to compare the current day with the past two weeks ridership for each of the, of, of, of the points. Okay, so we're going to create what is called a lag feature. Okay, in this case is, is for, is for 14 days. You can experiment, you can do seven days, 14 days, 21 days so far, because you have the data, you know, you have in, enough data here. One of the things that we're going to notice, and again, we're still splitting our data set into the weekdays and the, and the weekends, because we know that there's a different dynamic there. What we see is that there's a strong relationship in the weekends 
between the current ridership and the four and that two week daylight, the, the, the 14, the 14 daylight, the two week, two week lag. In the weekday, also there's a concentration and it's linear. There's a concentration here that the red, you know, the red dots. But something interesting happens that doesn't happen usually in the, you know, in the teal, in the teal area, the weekend. And is that there's a lot of dispersion, right? You know, in that line, there's a lot of dispersion to one side and to the other. So those really are, are you know, you can catalog them as outliers. In other words, they don't fall into that, you know, pattern that most of the points are. So what can we do? Well, one solution is to try to experiment with this, right? And the experiment that the authors did was to filter out the US holidays. In other words, let's take out the US holidays and also they experimented with taking out the low ridership, okay? And it's, it's here. In making this lag, they took out the lags that are less than 10,000. 10, Okay, so we are filtering tw twice by uh, major holidays, get, get that out, the major holidays, and also uh, low ridership. And what we have is now we have a more civilized, right? <laughs> more civilized plot, less dispersion, more compact compactness. So that means that US holidays, low ridership are uh, uh, characteristic of this data set that tend, you know, to be in the outlier of your your pattern. Okay. Comments, questions. It's interesting that it's very easy with the visualization. It's very easy to to see, you know, what is the effect of taking out, you know, one of the one of the components, right? Very, very, very simple, instead of you know just doing some table, et cetera. So this is the power basically of visualization that you can really see, you know, you can compare it, you can really see, you know, how 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 does it affect your, you know, your your your, your patterns or distributions. Okay. But definitely 14 day lag is a is, is a is definitely is a, is a apparently it's a good candidate for a prediction here. Okay. Okay, in the heat maps, uh, they presented though with this heat map. Okay, for the ridership data, we're going to create a month and day predictor. Okay, month and day, and we're going to uh, be filtering again. Uh, do an indicator, sorry, not filtering. Do an indicator of the ridership that is less than 10,000 10, thousand rides. So you have here the holidays. Okay, these are the breaks of the, you know, one of the axes. That's what we're going to be looking at. And then in the heat map, this is the pattern, right? For these holidays, this is the pattern in terms of low ridership on weekdays, okay? That occurred within the major US holidays. And as you can see, the pattern is very, is very stable, right? Okay, you know, you have a little bit up, a little bit down, etc. But you have a very steady, uh, you know, steady uh, uh, line uh, here. Okay, that's that's one, you know, example of one of the uses of a heat map. Okay, then the other one, which is kind of, uh, you know, usually I, I wouldn't do this, but you know, it's something that they want to they, they, they want to show you. Is a correlation matrix, and in the correlation matrix, usually you have you know numeric values, right? That say how correlated is one feature versus the other for the variables. Here, what they did was take all the stations, okay, the riderships of all the stations, and correlate each one of them with the other. What happened is that, as you can see, the color of the correlation is red. In other words, there's no blue or even, you know, uh, a little bit of white. There's none. Uh, so there's a lot of correlation between the ridership of the stations. So that means that we don't need that many uh, uh, data points. In other words, they are redundant. 
and that's the the message that they, that they are conveying in this in, in this visualization. In other words, you don't need that many data points in your data set, okay, to model the ridership because most of them are highly correlated. All right. Questions? It's right here uh, at the end. For feature selection, the high degree of correlation is a great indicator that the information present because present the stations is redundant and could be eliminated or reduced. One of the questions I had was with the mm -hmm. dendrogram component. Those right. um, variables that are grouped together, are those ones that we should combine? Is that what it is suggesting or am I... Am I reading that wrong? I know it affects like the ordering of the variables, right? But I didn't know what yeah. the next step was. And then what do we do, right? Yeah, the dendrogram, what it's doing is clustering, right? You know, uh, trying to get the most similar uh, pairs, pairs of, uh, of variables, you know, in that, in that cluster. So in a simpler, in a simpler one, and you can see in, in, in very, very, you know, uh, various examples, in a simpler one, you can see that when they cluster is that all those indications, okay? All this, all these indications in the rows in, in, this, in this dimension uh, tend to be very similar for, the, for those variables, okay? So what, what it's saying is that that cluster of points of variables, they have similar uh, correlation across that linear spectrum, okay? The same here. Okay, because we're, we're, we're talking about two dimensions here. So there's one dimension that goes from left to right, another one from top to down. Okay. Um, I like uh, basically spoil this a bit. Say that, <laughs> that they then choose some uh, stations as representatives of the others, no? And mm -hmm. my question is because I, I didn't stop uh, given much thought about this thing, but the 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 main nodes in these dendrograms will they uh, represent those stations? Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What 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 you have you, you cannot see it very well, but what you have here is stations, okay, and the riderships of each of the stations, okay. So. I mean, the matrix I mean, the, the is correlating name. each each station within the with, with the others. Okay. In fact, in the book they say that they didn't include Car, Clark, and Lake. These are the others one, the other ones. <laughs> so the point that they want to make is that uh, for all these stations, you don't need that many that that many uh, you know that that many variables. You can you know, reduce a lot, just picking out the ones that are really representative of, you know, that, that uh, you know, of, of the ridership. So let's say that you have in the cluster, you have three or four stations. If you pick one, you are sure that the information on that one encompasses the other, the other three, because they're very similar. Okay, if we have time, uh, because you know, I, I want to cover as much as possible into, into an hour, especially because I'm not going to be available uh, next week. Uh, if we can find, uh, we can find an example, a, a very you know, a, a smaller you know that data set, and you can see why the clusters are the way they are. Okay. Good. Okay. So going back then to the line plots, uh, this one is about the monthly average ridership, right? Remember the monthly monthly ridership? But it's by year, by weekday, exclu excluding holidays or weekends. So they split it. They, they are still splitting the ridership between weekdays and weekends. And we know that there's a big difference, right? We have the most ridership, the top uh, numbers, in the weekdays and the lower numbers in the, in the weekend. But here you have a progression. In other words, each year you have a line plot of the ridership for that year. And as you can see, one of the top ones, which is 2008, and they're going to be 
we're going to be we're going to be going, doing reference to that is going to be around this line okay this line here all right so what is this important sometimes you need to add certain external uh, variables or features that you think could add to the predictive model, you know, to the accuracy of the predictive model. So in this case, they uh, added the monthly average gas price per gallon, uh, US dollars per year. They got an information and they then compare it with this plot, compare it to the one that was above. And one of the conclusions that they can, you know, uh, formulate from this one is that remember 2008, which was at, at the peak, right? At the peak of the of the ridership. This is the line of 2008, which is also, also corresponds to a peak in gas prices in the United States within that uh, time period, 2001 and 2016. Okay, and this is the conclusion: price spike in the summer of 2008. Which is the same time that we that we can uh, ride their ship spikes. This one here. Okay. So the lesson here is that you can uh, add external factors, for example, uh, weather, weather factors, uh, gas prices. Uh, the theory, the hypothesis is that, for example, if, if gas goes up or spikes, then people will uh, be more incentivized to use uh, public transit, right? If available, of course, okay? Uh, also, uh, for I, I've seen for financials, right? Financials, the consumer price index, and also uh, the federal interest rate, the prime, you know, how does it fluctuate? Uh, it could have an effect on, you know, on, on your data, if you are, if you are doing financial uh, or, or even uh, real estate. Uh, analysis okay so those are things that can add to the model but you know you have to you have to make your case okay so i think this is the last one of the numeric is called is is, is our famous uh pca principal component analysis okay and uh, i i i believe that you are you're familiar with this uh what happens here, and is summarizing these four graphs, okay? We have the cumulative variance, you know, from the from the PCAs, right? We have a graph for the component one and component two, and again, the variation of the ridership by time of the year, okay? Remember the summertime, winter time, etc. Then we have the first component, which is more related to time, to uh, to uh, sorry, to ridership. And the second component that is related to use. So one of the things that they mentioned is that from the first two principal components, when you do your PCA, the first two account for almost 83% of the variance. So with those two principal components, practically you have most of the variance of the whole data. So this uh, technique is a good candidate to reduce that dimensionality. Then in the scatter plot, right? The scatter plot, as it is playing here, the first component focuses on the variation due to the part of the week. Okay. While the second component focuses on variation due to time. And this is the, the proof. In component one, remember those box plots that I showed you at the beginning? They're basically replicated here. Okay. You have a high ridership during the week, weekdays, low ridership during the week, weekends. Then also in component two, which is the time of the year, you have kind of, uh, you know, a lower uh, descent, you know, from year uh, to year, according to that component, okay? But yeah, but definitely PCA will be a good candidate here uh, to reduce all those thousand, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, columns that we, have, that we have, you know, originally in this data set. And this is your, you know, this is this is your justification. Okay. All right. So let's talk about OK Cupid. That is the matching, the, the, the online data site. 
Okay, this one is the data set. It has 51,000 plus observations and 38 columns. Okay, so not that bad, right? According to the thousand that we had in the Chicago uh, data set. But still, you know, considerable uh, amount of information. And in this one, and I guess that's why the authors uh, chose it, uh, you have a lot of categoricals. In the Chicago, you have more you know, numerical uh, uh, features there. So what, what are we trying to predict? What we're trying to predict the class here is, we're trying to predict if the person that is in this uh, data set with that profile of you know, all the information that it has been, it has been input in the dating set, if that person classifies as STEM, right? Science, technology, engineering, math, or, or not. So it's a binary, a classification here. So we want to know if the person qualifies as a STEM person or not. All right. So this is the whole you know, uh, data set. Uh, this is using uh, SKIM, the SKIM uh, 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 function uh, here, where it gives you, you know, a lot of information, especially for the, for the counts, et cetera, and also for the numerics. But one of the things that I noticed is that the class here, uh, what, what do you notice here? <laughs> let, me, let me take a, a little break here. <laughs> what do you notice? They, they all add very few in STEM. Uh-huh. Yeah, they're un so, unbalanced. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we have a highly unbalanced uh, class here, okay? Because around 80 something percent of the, of the class of other, you know, correspond to other, and then the rest, 18 something, correspond to STEM. So you have to account for that in your modeling. Sometimes you have, you can down sample, sometimes you can up sample, do some small, do some rows, all that. Okay, but this is, this is something that you have to take account because if you don't transform it somehow to alleviate this unbalance, then the algorithm, any algorithm, is going to have problems uh, uh, predicting the minority one. The, the majority is going to overtake the, the minority class. Okay. All right. So let's start with visualizing the outcome, the class, and then some of the predictors. And the first one that we are shown is the religion. Okay. So there are different religions. Uh, some of them are missing, as you can see. Okay, there's a large uh, count of um, missing in that particular uh, 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 category. And also, you can see in this one that the one in Islam, Muslim, the one in, in, in Islam, uh, it is or is very, uh, you know, it has it has a, a very low count. So you cannot distinguish really what's going on there. But if we transform this graph by like a stack chart, a bar chart, with in terms of count, now we're going to do the proportions now. Now we can see better how the proportions are split between the other and the stem. And the ones that have the more proportion in terms of their class, uh, for STEM is the Hinduism, okay? And I guess that, that makes sense, right? You know, there's a lot of people from uh, India, right? India that are very good uh, in STEM, right? Uh, I mean, it's historically, uh, they put a lot of effort into their uh, institutes of technology, IIT, India Institute of Technology, and that's one of their, you know, main, main uh, national goals, okay? Uh, the other is the one that has the more or the less STEM and the more participation in the other category. But you can see a gradient here, right? So that means that religion could be could be a good a good predictor because you can differentiate your class by the religion. Okay, and then we have this uh, chart which is like an error bar chart, which gives you 
the variance within the class within the, the, the religion category. And as you can see, Islam is the one that has the most variance and then Hinduism. Okay. So does religion appear to be related, excuse me, that? Does religion appear to be related to the outcome? Uh, according you know, to, the, to, the, to the grass, especially this bar chart, the stack bar chart, yes. Okay, there's a, in other words, if it was uniform across all you know, categories of religion, then you, will see, you, you wouldn't see that there's an, an information that it could be used for the model to classify. But here you have a gradient. In other words, there's more in one sector than in the other, okay? Good. All right, so let's see the class with a numerical predictor, the SA length, because in this particular data set, there's a factor called, a, a variable called SA length, and it's about you know, certain uh, uh, text that the person inputted. Sometimes they didn't input anything, but sometimes you know, they input you know, uh, a kind of a little, you know, maybe a biography or something. Anyway. Uh, here, again, we're going to facet by the class, stem and stem, and you can see that there is a distinction between the ones that are not classified as stem. They have usually, they have a concentration on the essay, essay length higher than in stem, okay? Uh, you could theorize that. Uh, stem usually is, uh, you know, scientific, is technology, is math, Usually the, you don't need that many words, <laughs> you know, to express, you know, what, you know, what, 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 what you're looking for. But then in the other, maybe you have more, you know, art people, uh, more education, et cetera. So maybe they are more verbose. You can theorize that, okay? But that's just speculation. So the other uh, graph chart that they uh, uh, constructed here is again, a gamma uh, model, okay, general additive models. And what it shows is that depending on the length of the essay, there is, uh, you know, there, there is um, a, a change, right? A change in the gradient, in the slope of that, you know, of, 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 the, of that model. They're using a logistic uh, regression here, of course, binary uh, classification. So one of the things that they, the authors uh, explain is that this predictor may be worth you know, looking for, but they say that it's unlikely to have a strong effect on its own. In other words, it has to be combined with other variables to get more predictive power. But definitely something that is worth looking for. Okay. All right. So let's explore then some visualizations between categoricals. And we already uh, did one, the religion, but let's, let's see if we can do another. And this one is going to be between predictions. So we're going to be analyzing the interaction between the response of the people of how they deal with alcohol. In other words, do they, uh, drink socially, do they drink, drink often, do they don't drink at all, and then drugs, okay? And our hypothesis could be that there's, there will be a relationship, somehow relationship with this. So to interpret this, okay, I would like to show you uh, from the data visualization with R, what they say about the mosaic plots. Okay, and the mosaic plus, what they do is that they can display the relationship between categorical variables using rectangles. That's why the mosaic, right? You know, different tiles, different rectangles, whose areas represent the proportion of cases for any given combination levels. So let's go back. Okay, so taking only the alcohol, taking only the alcohol, which is the label that has the most you know, proportion against the other levels from, from the chart. Uh, 
it looks like socially kind of dominates so, everything? Yes, because you see that it has a big chunk, right? Of the whole spectrum. Socially, it has a big chunk. That represents the, the proportion. The proportion of people that put that they were socially, you know, so, so uh, uh, do uh, drink alcohol socially against, you know, the other, the, the other labels. Okay, and if you do a count of this particular one, okay, let me see if I can I can show it to you. If we do OKC, right? OKC, can, can you see my screen down here? Down here. If I do count uh, drinks, which is alcohol, and sort it through, OK? You see that socially has a count of 36,000. So in the proportion, in the 51,000, 36,000 say that they are you know, socially, uh, they drink alcohol socially. What about drugs? The same. Which is the class that has the most, you know, the most proportion? The never category. Never. Okay. So as you can see, never and socially basically kind of intersect here, right? Okay, and they have the biggest, you know, area of the homo say they have the biggest area. So you could say that people that drink alcohol socially and also they, they fall in the same category as people that never use drugs. Okay, you could say that, of course, you know, to do it statistically, you know, significant, you have to do a couple more things. But at least visually, you can see that that there's a big chunk of people that intersect between alcohol, socially, drugs, never. All right? Okay, so uh, the authors, of course, you know, uh, the authors uh, have a strong, uh, you know, frequencies, uh, statistical background. Uh, you know, they refer most of the time to p-values, et cetera. You can do for all these categories, you can do what is called a Pearson chi-square test. And you'll see that because the value is going to be very small, uh, there's a, definitely there's a relationship. In other words, they're not independent. Th those two, those two uh, variables, those two categories, they're not independent. The p-value, which is small, says that there is a, there's no dependence, so there could be an association with it. So to get it a little more, more clearly, and this chart has a, has a, has a little kink. <laughs> Here and I will explain why. And is that this is called a corresponders analysis. It's kind of a PCA, but for categorical, for categorical factors. And what it does is that it tries to group uh, the labels from one category to another label from another category. And as you can see, socially and never are kind of in the same area, right? Okay, kind of in the same area. Also, if you look at the book very often, and there's a label that I don't know why it doesn't show, but there's a label from often from the other variable that also, you know, has uh, has a very uh, you know that, that they're in the same in the same group in the same the same kind of cluster uh, there. So this one reaffirms what we're seeing here that there's a relationship between people that drink alcohol socially and people. That drink that don't, don't, not, never have, have used drugs. How does it relate to the outcome? That's another thing. <laughs> That's another thing. This is between the predictors trying to study, you know, different sides of the predictors. And there are other, you know, tests that we can do besides the Pearson. There's some non parametric uh, tests that we can do too. Okay, but that's kind of out of the scope here. Okay. Okay, so. What time do we have? Good. So this one, I still, you know, in progress. Uh, it's in it's in construction, and it's it's it's, it's something not it is it's not that that uh, uh that they they did more importance to the to the to the pre model 
and the postmodern. But there's some, uh, you know, uh, uh, theory that they discuss that it would be good to, to explore there. That, that's when, you know, you have the model and then you want to see, okay, I'm observing this. How can I, you know, uh, do a better resampling? Or uh, incorporate features uh, and other features that I deselected, etc. Okay. So that's it for this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. okay. So remember, I'm not going to be. Uh, uh, available next week but please continue okay you know i'll watch the, the recording uh, you know get, give you some comments if, if, if any yeah I'll, I'll see you next week i'm on with categoricals excellent good, good, it's good. about it's about 20 pages i'll be ready okay <laughs> excellent okay. see you then friday bye-bye okay. okay take care guys thank bye, you everyone. everyone bye bye, -bye. thank you